President Christ, before I really get into the meat of our message this morning, I want to kind of explain some terminologies I'm going to be using today. And it is the difference between philosophy and science. Now, science deals with those things you can actually observe. For example, I can observe 2 plus 2 equals 4. Under a microscope, I can see cell division and cell diversification. Under scientific controlled experience, experiments, I can see what takes place and can make good conclusions of why that is happening. That's science. It's dealing with observable facts that you can use with your five senses. Philosophy is different. Philosophy deals with what is called metaphysics, and the Greek word meta means above or beyond the physical. Science deals with the physical. Philosophy deals with that which is beyond. For example, is there a heaven? Is there a God? Do we have a soul? Is there a spiritual dimension of life? Philosophy deals with those questions. And so as I put this question before you today of whether or not has evolution won the day. I'm not going to be talking about all the science stuff about that. I'm going to be talking about the philosophy of evolution. And what the subliminal message of that philosophy is. When you get right down to it, evolution basically says that we are products of the God of chance which is really hard to believe them when you think about it, because they want to talk about how things are created from a simple cell and evolves into great complex cells. It goes from simplicity to complexity, which just seems kind of odd and against all of our observations in this world. But by chance, it happened. And the God of chance needs death in order to make the product better. In the evolution, death is necessary to improve life. It is only by people dying over and over again that we will eventually conquer all diseases, <clears throat> conquer everything that holds us back from eternity in this world. And so evolution says, do not fear death. You may be just one of the products that need to happen in our world in order to advance life. So death serves evolution. And we are just products of chance. And some might say, well, wait a minute. I think in my mind that I'm not a product of chance. But you know, when you take evolution to the extreme, this is what they always say. The molecules in your brain just by chance are leading you to this illusion. And even this God of chance permeates our conversation, right? Well, thank my lucky stars today. Luck deals with chance. Oh, I am so lucky that that happened. Luck deals with chance. And then we talk about the cohort of the God of chance. We call her Lady Luck. The philosophy abounds in our world and in our language today. And when it comes to understanding this subliminal philosophy of evolution, the result is this. Life is meaningless. There is no purpose for our creation. We have no purpose for our existence. We are existing in a meaningless vacuum. So you kind of wonder if the band's in 1977, named Kansas, sung a truth. All we are is dust in the wind. And in that song, there's a verse that says, we are just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we are is dust in the wind. The winds of chance have formed us from the dust into existence. And the winds of chance will one day blow us out of existence. 
Is it any wonder when this philosophy is being taught in our school systems and in our culture today that suicide is becoming a more and more prevalent problem? Because what's the natural result? If an individual is really convinced about the meaningless of life, why not just get it over with sooner than later? Why wait so long? Why not let your death advance life sooner? Why is it in this world that our culture and the people which live in this culture are drawn to darkness? For example, making the movie The Joker one of the highest profitable films in record history? Why is it that our kids are, are drawn to games like Grand Theft Auto, where life in those video games do nothing but serve the contestant? You kill to gain, and life only serves gain. You wonder if this subliminal philosophy has a lot to do with how people are viewing life today. Against this philosophy of evolution, Jesus Christ comes into this world and he tells us a couple of very, very important things. First of all, in the gospel reading today, he tells us we have purpose. We do not have a meaningless life. He tells us right up front in the gospel today, you are the salt. He tells us in the gospel today, you are the light. You have a reason to be here. And when you want to look at the uses of salt back in those days and even today, what is this metaphor communicating? Well, salt is used to preserve things. People apply salt so that things will last. So if we are the salt of the world, we are to make a difference in this world. We are to do what we can to preserve this world from going further into decay and darkness and destruction. We are to apply the salt of the gospel and stop the best we can this decadent movement. Salt is also used to make things flavorful. And with the salt of the gospel that we share with one another, we make people flavorable to God. St. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 that we are a pleasing aroma to Christ but only because we've come to faith in Christ. And so maybe in your world, you might know someone that needs to be salted with the gospel of Jesus. You have a purpose. You are the salt of the world. And Jesus goes on with another metaphor saying you are the light. And you don't light a light and then put it under a bushel so that nobody can see what you've just accomplished, you light a light to illuminate the darkness. And so we are to take the light of Christ into this dark world and let other people see this hope. And so that when they are leaving in, living in darkness, they may be moved to the light of hope before they are moved to destruction. You are the light of the world. Both metaphors mean this. Both metaphors mean that we are not to remove ourselves from this world. A lot of people will think, well, I don't want to go over there because we'll get contaminated or we'll be impure because they're going to win and we're going to get the wrong influence and I want my kids protected. Salt doesn't do any good sitting in a shaker. It's got to be applied. Light doesn't do any good unless it illuminates darkness. It's got to be applied. So with these metaphors, Jesus is basically saying, don't think you as a Christian need to hide yourself up in some little hole, protect yourself from the world. You need to be engaged in the world. You need to make a difference in the world. You are salt. You are light. God has made this possible for you. And in this gospel reading today, Jesus also tells us that we do not only have a purpose, but our life has meaning. Simple look at the cross of Christ can tell us this. Would Jesus Christ have died for people who have no meaning to him? Does not the Christ through the cross tell you you have value? 
and that you and your life is very meaningful to him. He died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The cross tells us that Christ has given us this righteousness so that we may have fulfillment of life in heaven. He shares with his hearers this morning that you will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, people who were listening to those words at that time must have been scared because the scribes and the Pharisees were top-notch. You can't beat their righteousness. But even what Jesus says is their righteousness is not even good enough for heaven. You need a better one than that. And God gives us this through his son Christ, a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees so that we might experience just not a meaningful life here at earth, but a fuller meaningful life in heaven. The cross of Christ tells us we are loved, tells us we are wanted. You can illustrate this with the example of a human family. Man and a woman get married. And one of the things that happens in marriage is they wish to express their love outside of their relationship. And what takes place when they desire and God so wills for them, they have children. They wish to love outside their marriage. And they have children. Children are a product of love. That's what God wanted to do when he created us. He wanted to love someone outside of himself like himself. Remember it says in the Bible we were created in his image. God wanted to share his love with someone outside of himself. And that someone is you and me. We are wanted people. We have lives that are meaningful to our Christ. And in this cross of Jesus Christ, we not only come to know our loving Father, but our loving Redeemer, and come to understand a yet further purpose for us, a purpose that we were originally created for, but we lost when we fell into sin. Martin Luther tells us about this purpose being reinstated through the blood of Jesus when he says in the meaning of his second article that Christ has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, not purchase me with gold or silver, but as one with me with his holy precious blood and his innocent and suffering and death, that I, and here is the purpose, may be his own, live under him, and serve him in everlasting righteousness and purity forever. That's why we were created in the first place, to serve God in purity and righteousness. Lost it, we fell into sin, reinstated it through the blood of Jesus Christ.